Hello, in this video I'd like to show you some of the basics and maybe some of the not so basics about generating notation in SCAMP. If you haven't watched the videos earlier in this series, you should probably do that since this video assumes that you've seen those. So to talk about notation, first we need some music to notate. So I've created here a, a fairly simple script. The first few lines should seem very familiar, importing everything from the SCAMP library, also importing the random library, creating a session, creating a couple new parts, the clarinet and the bassoon. Now in this next line here, I create a list of bass notes. These pitches form a kind of a classic lament bass, which we repeat twice. Multiplying a list by two is like adding it to itself. So we get two copies of the lament gesture, followed by this kind of ascending gesture. This next line here defines a set of clarinet patterns, which we'll choose randomly among. Each one represents a list of intervals above that bass note, and none represents a rest. So now this should be familiar from the forking functions video. I've put the two parts in two separate functions, which I then fork from the session and then ask the session to wait for the children to finish. I'm actually gonna keep it simple and remove these lines so that all the bassoon part does is play through every bass note in bass notes, so this entire list, and each note is going to be full volume and last for one second or one beat. The clarinet part's a little bit more interesting. It also loops through the bass note list, but for each bass note, it's going to play one of these patterns above that bass note. So it's going to randomly choose a pattern from the patterns list, and then it's going to play through that pattern above the bass note, with each note having a length of one over the length of a pattern. So a pattern like this that has four notes in it, each of those notes is going to have length 0.25. A pattern like this will have one note of length one, and a pattern like this will have three notes of length one third. So then here you see we loop through the intervals in the pattern. If it's a none, then we wait for that note length. And if there's a number, then we play a note, which is the given interval above the bass note. This creates a kind of meandering contrapuntal texture, since each of these patterns is designed to make reasonable intervals above whatever bass note. But because the bass note keeps changing, the harmonic implications of these patterns keep changing as well. Let's take a listen to what it sounds like. second loop through the bass notes here. Now here's the ascending pattern. Now that was a bit of an abrupt ending. This music's actually kind of designed to loop, but we don't want it to loop forever because we want to generate notation from it. Now in terms of generating notation, the important thing to remember is that the session, one of its roles is as a transcriber. So that means we can ask the session S to start transcribing what's being played. Here we'll do that right at the bottom, but before any of the notes get played, we say S dot start, and if I hit tab, it completes it to say start transcribing. Below, after all the music has been played, I can say S dot stop transcribing. And what this does is it returns a performance object, and we can actually assign that to a variable. So we can say performance equals s dot stop transcribing. And this performance is basically just a record of exactly what has just been played. In fact, what I'm going to do here is print performance. Let's take another listen, and in the video I'll probably fast forward this a bit. <laughs> Now if we look here in the printout, we have a performance object with two performance parts inside of it. And each of those parts is filled with performance notes. All in all, this corresponds to a full record of everything that was just played. Note that this is still completely independent of the idea of how it's notated. Performances don't care about the difference between a dotted quarter note and a quarter note tied to an eighth note. Now to turn a performance into a score, one in which all of these rhythms are placed into bars and quantized, we call performance.toScore. 
And then to see what that score looks like, we say dot show. This is going to use the library abjad, which uses lily pond to create a PDF of the score. Finally, before we run this, there's an important trick that I want to show you. Often when you're dealing with notation, you don't want to hear the music over and over and over. And to avoid hearing it, you can ask the session to fast forward. We can say s.fast, and if I hit tab, there's various options. I'm going to say fast forward to beat 100. And what this means is it's not going to play any of the music until beat 100. And in this case, that's all of the music. So it will skip straight to showing us a score. Fast forward to beat or fast forward to time is actually also really useful when you're dealing with a longer piece and you want to check what it sounds like somewhere further along in the piece. But for now, we'll just use it to avoid listening to all of this again. Let's take a look at what the music looks like. And there we go. Now, of course, this might not be exactly the way you want the score to look. For instance, maybe there's a different title that you want, a different composer that you want. Maybe you want it in a different time signature. Maybe you want the notes to be spelled a little bit differently. Let's take a look at how we would do that. So a lot of these options can be accessed as arguments to the toScore function. We can change the title with the keyword argument title. I'll call this wandering lament. And we can change the composer with the keyword composer. And to abdicate responsibility, I'll say not Mark Evanstein. As for time signature, we can use the keyword time signature. And you can give it a string like this. I'll set it to 2, 4. Let's take another look. Looks great. Let's look at a few more options for time signature. Instead of a single time signature, you can actually give it a list of time signatures, like 3, 2, 4, 3, 4, 6, 8, 5, 4. And if I play this, you'll see that it does those time signatures in order. You can also use the special keyword here, loop, to have this list of time signatures loop. Two, four, three, four, six, eight, five, four, two, four, three, four, six, eight, five, four, etc. If instead of just giving it a set of time signatures, what you're really interested is in having bar lines in particular places, you can instead use the keyword argument bar line locations. Here I'll ask for a bar line uh, after 4 beats, 7 beats, 9.5 beats, 12 beats, 17 beats, and 20 beats. Let's take a look at that. Oops, should have said bar underscore line locations. Based on the location of the bar lines, Scamp figures out reasonable time signatures to fill the space. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to just having it be regular 4-4 music. And I'll show you really quickly about spelling. One simple way to address spelling is to define a default spelling policy. You can do this at either the session level or the instrument level. So uh, for the session, I could say default spelling policy equals, oops, not sure what happened there. Default spelling policy equals B flat minor. And if I run it again, we see that everything is now spelled consistent with B flat minor. You can also use this default spelling policy at the uh, instrument level rather than at the session level. So if I put it right here, then we see that the uh, bassoon part is spelled consistent with B flat minor, but the clarinet part still has some sort of funky elements to it. Finally, if you need more granular control over what happens with note spelling, you can actually define the spelling policy on the individual note level. The way that you do this is through the fourth properties argument. 
For instance, if I wanted this to follow um, the key of B flat minor, I could say spelling colon B flat minor. This would affect all of the notes played by the assumed part, but only because it's, it's in every single play note call. If you want a particular note to be spelled as a sharp or as a flat, you can actually just use the uh, hash for sharp and the B for flat. And in fact, Scamp kind of figures out that uh, you're talking about spelling. So you can even just write a sharp on its own. Let me show you what that looks like. Now, of course, this looks a little bit ridiculous. Every single note in the bassoon part is spelled with a sharp of some kind, even if it's a, a white note, right? So this A natural is forced to be spelled as a sharp, as a G double sharp. But hopefully you get the idea. You have pretty granular control over how notes are spelled this way. It's also worth noting that some of the other things that you can put in this fourth properties argument also translate to notation. So for instance, if I write staccato, then as we'll see, not only do the notes play back shorter, but they also get rendered as staccato in the score. Before I move on to a few more advanced features, it's also worth noting that show down here generates a score using abjad and lily pond. But you can also say show XML to generate a score in music XML and open it up in whatever notation software you typically use. So if I run this here, and actually from here, you can just play it back. Of course, it looks like the new score didn't quite figure out that it was a clarinet and bassoon sound, but I'm sure that you can alter that in the playback settings of Muse score. So that's the basics. Stay tuned for a few more advanced things. Okay, so a lot of the more advanced elements of uh, showing scores in Scamp come down to the fact that Scamp is built to treat both pitch and duration and all other playback parameters as continuous by default. So to start with, that means we have to address microtonality. So let's say that each of these bass notes, um, instead of being exactly what they are, let's say that these bass notes are 30 cents sharp. So we add 0.3 to the pitch. If we render the notation, then we'll see that uh, we get some uh, quarter tone flat, quarter tone sharp markings. Basically what's happened here is um, since quarter tone markings are as good as uh, we can normally expect in notation program without a lot of finagling, all pitches have been rounded to the nearest quarter tone. However, if we want to uh, keep in the score exactly what the pitch was, we can enable microtonal annotations by saying engraving settings. So engraving settings is one of the things imported with Scamp. And there's quite a bit of uh, flexibility hidden under the hood within this object. So we can ask engraving settings to show microtonal annotations by setting this flag to true. And if we do that, then now each note is annotated with the exact MIDI pitch that it generated it. While we're talking about pitch, we should also cover the possibility of glissandi. So I'll have this bass note um, go down to bass note minus five, bass note plus one, and bass note minus 12. So this is gonna be a kind of really bouncy glissando down and up and down. And I'm actually gonna switch over to the uh, lily pond base notation. Unfortunately, glissandi uh, render pretty inconsistently through music XML. Each program that it, um, interprets XML files does something differently wrong, but pretty much all of them get it wrong in some way. However, the lily pond output should look pretty good. So you can see that each of these notes was uh, sort of split up according to the um, points at which the glissando turned around. There's quite a few options here that you can look at under um, engraving settings dot glissandi. I won't get into them here, but if you look up engraving settings in the documentation, you can find more about it. So that's pitch. Now what about rhythm? In the video on tempo, we, we saw that independent parts like this can actually be operating with independent tempo curves. 
So if we allow each of them to take its, their clock as an argument, then we can ask these clocks to set tempo targets. So clock.set tempo target. And let's say that we have the bassoon part set a tempo target of 200 over the course of 50 beats. Well, let's say 30 beats. And on the other hand, let's have the clarinet part set a tempo target of 30 over the course of 15 beats. So the clarinet part will be slowing down and the bassoon part will be speeding up. Let's take a listen to this and also look at the notation. I'm gonna uh, stop fast forwarding so we can hear it this time. Oops. I think it's gonna be best if we leave these bass notes as single notes this time. Here we go. Of course, the clarinet part's left on its own here because the bassoon part ended way too early. So as you can see, you, you get legible notation, but not notation that anyone would really want to play. Because the session itself was still running at quarter equals 60, the entire score is kind of squeezed into quarter note equals 60. And the ritardando is, uh, is done through longer note values and the accelerando through shorter note values. But you see, you get these horrible septuplets and well, no one wants to deal with this. So that's why we have some options here uh, for quantization that you can apply in the to score call. So I'm going to make each of these a separate line. And I'm going to add a um, keyword argument here, max divisor equals. Now, the default max divisor is 8. So I'm going to make the max divisor 4. This way, the worst that can happen is 16th notes. And I'm going to go back to commenting this back in so that we don't have to listen to that again. Okay, so you can already see that this is much more legible notation. The only potential downside here is that some of the notes in the clarinet part have gotten stuck together as chords because they happen too soon, uh, one right after the other. Quantization is all about trade-offs, so the goal in SCAMP is to give you control over just how those trade-offs work. On that note, there's one other kind of control that's worth mentioning. Instead of a max divisor, you can use the simplicity preference argument. The difference here is that while a max divisor sets a hard cutoff for how large of a divisor you allow, a simplicity preference just weights it towards simpler or more complicated divisors. Now the exact mechanics of how a particular number translates to different choices is a bit hard to describe. So it's better to just try out different numbers for simplicity preference. For instance, if we set the simplicity preference to 10, that should be a pretty strong simplicity preference. And if we run it, even though we're allowed divisors up to eight, we see that we're no longer getting any of those sevens. You could get a septuplet, but you'd probably only get it if it were exactly a septuplet. Maybe this simplicity preference was a little too strong, so I'm gonna move it down to four. Let's take a look at what happens now. So with a simplicity preference of four, you start to see a couple quintuplets and septuplets. Not so many as before, because the rhythm has to really fit well into a septuplet or quintuplet for it to go with that divisor. Anyway, hopefully that gives some sense of uh, the control that you have over quantization, but it's worth noting that there's also a option to specify a quantization scheme. And, um, this is where the true flexibility lies. If we check the documentation under a quantization scheme, 
this is ultimately what all of those preferences are getting converted to. And we see that a quantization scheme is made up of a list of measure quantization schemes, which are made up of a list of beat quantization schemes. And you can actually make it so that different beats are quantized in different ways. And instead of setting a max divisor, you can set a complete list of all divisors that you would allow. Basically, there's a lot of flexibility. The only thing that you can't do is you can't do nested tuplets. So if that's central to your musical language, you may have to find some workarounds. Okay, one final thing that I want to do here. I'm going to go back to having a simplicity preference of four. So I want to point out that the notation that we were just looking at was um, s sort of squeezed into a context of quarter note equals 60, because that was the tempo at which the session was operating. However, we can actually generate the notation relative to the bassoon clock or the clarinet clock if we want to. So I'm going to move this start transcribing actually to after the fork calls. And I'm going to let the fork calls return the clocks. So clarinet clock equals s dot fork and um, bassoon clock equals s dot fork. If this doesn't ring a bell, you should go back and look at the tempo video where I explain how you can get access to the different clocks on which different processes are running. So if I say clock equals clarinet clock as an argument to s dot start transcribing. Then let's look at what happens to the notation. Now we see that we start at quarter note equals 60 and there's actually a ritardando down to quarter note equals 30. And the clarinet part looks exactly like it did in the original notation before we introduced all of the accelerandi and ritardandi. The bassoon part though looks all funky because all of its notes are having to be uh, written relative to this tempo curve. So not only is it speeding up and its notes are getting objectively shorter, but this is compounded by the fact that the prevailing tempo is slowing down, so they have to get even that much shorter. If we want the bassoon part to look nice and pretty, then we can start transcribing on the bassoon clock. And if we look at that notation, well, actually we get an error, which is interesting. The reason we're getting an error here is that the bassoon part actually, because it's accelerating, ends before the clarinet part. And so its clock disappears and Scamp starts to complain. We could probably solve this problem by saying, wait 50, let's say, in the bassoon part. Try showing it again. Anyway, so you see here that the bassoon part is now just straight quarter notes. Uh, with the accelerando at the top, and the clarinet part slows down quite a bit, since now it's playing very slow notes at a very fast tempo. Anyway, that's probably more than you ever wanted to know about how to make notation in Scamp. As you've hopefully seen, uh, the basics aren't too difficult, but there's also a lot of flexibility and nuance under the hood if you look for it. So happy composing, thanks.